welcome to the Maya Maya Events podcast. We empower business owners to elevate, scale, and 10x their businesses through face to face, virtual events, and beyond. We talk tips, hacks, and stories from other entrepreneurs so that you can thrive, grow, and level up your business. Hello, and welcome to the next episode of the Maya Maya Events podcast. I wanted to really spend today introducing myself as the last episode I'll let you know about all the fun stuff that we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks Um, and I have an absolutely stellar lineup of experts for you who are going to talk everything from how to sell in a webinar to how to launch a webinar series and get bums on seats to how to pivot your business from a solely face-to-face business to an online business and really make webinar the source of all that fun. I guess today I really wanted to introduce myself to you properly. Who is this woman that says she's going to help our businesses and help us grow? What does she know about pivoting? Um, What does she know about business? So I thought I'd start at the beginning. I left school at 18 and uh, joined the police as a forensics officer. And I have to say, I loved it. After being fed up of being talked at at school, university didn't appeal to me anymore. I got lots of places. I did what my mum and dad expected. Sorry, mum and dad. I did what the teachers expected and got places at good unis. But I'd had enough. I didn't want to go down that path. So I got myself a job with the police and literally straight out of school, started in the police in the September. And There I stayed for 15 years worth of adventures and I saw some sights in the forensic world. I was a crime scene examiner or a CSI, slightly less glamorous than the TV. The wind doesn't always blow your hair. It's not always sunshiny and you haven't got a cool pair of sunglasses and a gun. But apart from that, exactly the same. Uh, I examined everything from burglary scenes to firearms offences to sexual assault scenes and everything in between got promoted a couple of times um, and then ran a team of of examiners for the north of London, uh, moved around a bit and then started running the team for the south of London. And then I started to specialise in firearms, which I absolutely loved. And that was a real big shift, real something different. It was away from the day to day and much more about relationship building and influencing policy and really getting people on board um, with new ideas and new thinking Um, and I really enjoyed my time um, in the firearms section and kind of working in the part of a national project and it wasn't until I went back to working shifts and with the budget cuts um, lots of the forensic facilities were cut and photography was one of them and the photography job then passed to the scene examiners so it meant that we were going out to more and more dead bodies they're way more than usual, um, everything from suicides, murders, suspicious deaths. And that was really when the cracks started to show for me. And I take it back to MJ DeMarco's book, um, Unscripted. He says that everybody has F this moments. Please insert your choice of F swear word here. And that was really one of mine. I went to a particular job Um, A quick one that I thought I'll help the next shift out. It's right at the end of my shift, but it means this shift doesn't have to deal with it. Went along, should have been really straightforward. And the person I met on scene was a probationer. And this was their first dead body that they'd ever been to. They were very green, very sweaty. And I just felt a mixture of things. Really sorry for them that this was the first body that they dealt with. And they'd just been left at the scene to get on with it. And really angry that we as an organization then were doing that to this person so I kind of held my tongue and helped them through it and we got the job done and it's going to get a bit graphic now to show shut small people's ears or switch the headphones this guy had hung himself right behind the door um, in this flat and the only way I could get in was to push the door from one side with this officer helping me but I thought this officer can't come into the flat because if he faints, which is a high probability, um, I then can't get out of the room on my own. So I was in there doing what is effectively their job for them, as well as my job, and yelling instructions through the door. And 
it just made me really angry that this just wasn't right. And for the first time that night, I started dreaming about that particular body, about how sad that person had been and how desperate they'd been and nobody could help them, coupled with how angry I was about the position that the officer had been put in. And this got progressively worse and I started getting more and more anxious about going to work and started getting really tearful about the thought of going into work and I recognised that it wasn't right. I started not sleeping. I said to my boss at the time, look, I'm really struggling here. I don't want to go sick. I don't necessarily need to be off work. I just need to have a little break from bodies. And I just have a couple of weeks just to settle myself, to decompress. And long story short, the answer was you don't get to pick and choose. You need to just suck it up and do your job. And that's when I had my first F this moment. That's when, I guess, looking back, I decided to have my first pivot. Here I was as a manager and a leader in the organisation, protecting my team of 30, 50 staff at the time. Yet I wasn't afforded the same provisions. So that's when I decided I needed to change. And I started looking for jobs outside the organisation, but actually ended up getting promoted. So I moved away from Frontline and into the Forensics Laboratory. So was running the forensics team in the lab, Um, 160 staff, multi-million pound budgets. I thought, yes, this is the change that I need. This gets me out of that, that, that line of work that's causing me these issues and gives me something completely new to focus on. Um, It was completely alien to me. I'm not a scientist by trade, not in the true pure sense. I work in the science field, but I didn't have a science background, a laboratory background. But actually, that wasn't needed. I recognised that I was a leader and I could lead people. So actually, by recruiting some of my team to run their teams better, meant that I could run this ship. I said ship with a P. And yeah, for 18 months, I got stuck into this this challenge, this new adventure, and learned loads and learned about contracts and procurement and I didn't really have an HR team. So the HR for the 160 came to me workflow and systems management and project management budget controls all of that came through me Um, we had several change procedures we had all sorts of things and then towards the end we had unfortunately had um, the Westminster Bridge attack the London Bridge attack and the Manchester bombings all in a really short space of time and all of that work came in through my team So you can understand the kind of pressure size that I was under. And that's also when I noticed that this cracking that had appeared two years before hadn't completely gone away. It was still there, but just in a different form. I started not sleeping. Um, I was lucky if I got three hours sleep a night. Um, I had stress eczema that crept up my body. Um, My weight fluctuated up and down. And ultimately, I ended up with stress incontinence. And, um, you know, I couldn't be more than 20 minutes um, before needing the loo. And if I got anxious, it got even worse. Um, so, yeah, at the age of 32, I was I was a winner. Um, you know, peeing myself left, right and centre, desperately tired, super stressed, working crazy long hours to try and get the work done. And I couldn't really see the light at the end of the tunnel. It really hit home for me how much I was working when we went, my wife and I went to the the Lions Rugby in New Zealand. And we were away for nearly four weeks. And when I came back, I still had loads and loads, nearly my year's entitlement of annual leave to use. All I'd done was burn through all the time off in lieu that I'd accrued um, through my time. And that's when I really thought, "Mm, okay, maybe I'm, working a bit too hard here I am going to burn out and I'd started in the very few hours that I didn't work to bake cakes it's something I've always loved it's something I found I find still really quite meditative and a friend of ours said would you bake one for my my 50th yeah sure no problem decorated baked the cakes um, and it went well and a few more people said would you bake for my ex-party or the wedding or all sorts of things so inadvertently started a sideline a bit of a side hustle of 
cake decorating as well as all my crazy, crazy work. But it was it was different. Um, and any of you that have got a side hustle will recognise this, that I could come home from the day job, utterly beat, exhausted, grumpy. And then when you start doing the work for your side hustle, the thing that you really love, all of that melts away. And I'd have a second wave of energy. I'd have lots of energy to be able to throw into it, creative energy. It was almost like my day job used my brain and my side hustle used my creativeness and my heart. And I really, really enjoyed it. Fast forward to January, February time of 2018. I was still working in forensics. I was still did my cake bit at the weekend. And I remember saying to my boss, look, I am really feeling it. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm really burning out. I don't think I can keep this up for much longer if something doesn't change. I'm already doing really crazy long hours. How about I just do four compressed days? That way I won't keep building up loads of time off in loo. I am doing that many hours anyway. I can get some good rest and it doesn't have to be a Friday. You know, I'm not looking for the jolly Friday every week. It can be any day really. And it would just give me time to do things that fill my soul. That request was taken to the board. And the reply I got was, Along the lines of, well, if you had kids, well, we'd have to let you, but you don't. So it's not really suitable for the role. And that made me so mad. Um, I It's my choice, conscious choice not to have children. So that means for this organisation that I've been working for 15 years, I hadn't had to pay full paid maternity leave for six months. I hadn't had my full payment, including all my shift allowances and premium payments while I was pregnant. I had actually been covering for everybody that did have kids. I was the one that worked Christmases. And yet the time I asked for help the second time, I still get not very much back. Um, and I launched a bit of an appeal and made quite a bit of noise about it and eventually got the flexible working pattern agreed. But by then the damage had been done. I'd already been shown with actions how little the organisation thought of me as an individual and my well-being, the two times that I did reach out for help, it wasn't forthcoming. And that's really when I started to question, is this organisation for me? Does it value me? I'm certainly not paid what I'm worth. The work that I was doing was enough for three people. And in private industry, I know would be earning three-figure salary easily. Yet I was struggling to take home much more than about two and a half thousand pounds a month, which sounds like a really good wage. But for the work that I was doing it didn't tally it wasn't aligned and I started to think maybe I am actually worth more maybe my value is more and at the same time my wife sat me down and said if you don't stop soon you're going to break and I have a very real feeling that I will need to you know have have you have some serious professional help so we kind of sat down and at the same time a business popped up on my Facebook called Shift to Success, which is run by uh, an amazing guy called Alexander Siri, who is now a very good friend of mine. But he was running a program then for to help police officers and police staff get out of a job that they hated and into a life that they love. That's a long story, long story short. Um, so I went along to um, one of his sessions and I was sold. If he could help me build a business and not need to work in the police anymore, that was for me. Joe and I sat down in the March over Easter, did our numbers, worked it out that we could afford to live on her salary alone for a short time. So in the interest of my health and sanity and our marriage, I handed in my notice and it was terrifying and I felt sick and I thought, what am I doing? I've spent 15 years in an organisation building a career and I'm just throwing it away. I'm just saying enough's enough. That was the scariest pivot I have ever made. But instantly, as soon as I'd handed over that piece of paper and had that conversation, the relief was incredible. So I knew it was the right thing. I knew in my soul it was the right thing to do. And then spent the 12 weeks of my notice period <laughs> convincing everybody else around me that I was actually going. Um, so I think people still believe, and, and it happens in organisations where everyone's institutionalised, Everyone believes you're not really going to go or you'll go, but you'll be back soon. 
Not for me. I walked out the door on the 30th of June and I launched my first business, my and my weddings on the 30th of June. I had my first full paying client um, in the August and haven't looked back since. Um, so that was my huge cataclysmic life pivot. And since, since then, the work world for me has been a series of pivots and adjustments. And I think all of us that are in business or own a business, even if it's a side hustle, know that you have to continually redirect and adjust. Um, and that's all a pivot is, is an adjustment in direction. You've still got the same ultimate goal. You're just going to go about it in a slightly different way. And my my weddings was that for me. It was the UK's number one LGBT wedding planning service. Um, it was voted wedding planner of the year nationally, 2019. And we really started to build this strong profile. Cut to um, the summer of 2019, wedding business is ticking over beautifully. And a couple of mentors approached me and said, hey, you organize stuff. Could you help us with some face-to-face -face programs that we're doing? So accelerators, workshops, conferences, seminars, that sort of thing. I thought, oh, okay, interesting avenue for the business. Sure. In a pivot and adjustment, let's go with that. And my, my events started to take shape. It wasn't really born at this stage. I would say it was really born January 2020, where I'd had so much interest from people who were running accelerators or learning programs, but really loved the way that we did 4D events. So essentially, I took the whole experience concept from weddings and applied it to events. We do things like introducing scent or smell and introducing different lighting to set mood, really thinking about the atmosphere you want to create in your events and then thinking about what you're going to say, thinking about how that we wanted the attendees to feel. What do you want them to walk away knowing? I'm really trying to create an atmosphere where you can attach your content to emotion. That way people remember it longer. People are more inclined to use it. So cut to January 2020, the diary is booked. I've taken on my first, second member of staff with a view to them helping me run events as I was becoming a bit bottlenecked and then took my wife skiing for the first time in three years. We hadn't been able to afford to because we were living on one salary, but that was on my vision board. That was, I'll know when I'm okay again, when I can take her skiing, which is what we did in March 2020. And it was sitting on the bed in the chalet that we saw the news about this lockdown creeping across Italy, then into France, where we were at the time. And I just looked at Sharon and said, I think this might be coming to the UK. If it does, I'm really worried. My business is going to be sunk overnight. There'll be no weddings. That's business number one. There'll be no business events, no face-to-face -face events. That's business number two. What the bloody hell am I going to do? And Almost overnight, I thought, okay, I've been using Zoom for years for client meetings. How can I make this work as an event? And literally within three days, I'd written a new process for how to deliver business events in the virtual space. I'd got my existing clients on board. So don't take back all of your money that you've kindly invested with me. Let me deliver your contract in a different way, which we did. And then as I landed home, I really hit the ground running and just started pushing out as much content as I could. I realized people were were desperate. People's businesses were collapsing around their ears. And if there was something that I could do to help, I was going to do it. So passing out content. This is how you launch a Zoom call. This is how you run a Zoom call for more than five people. This is how you record a Zoom session. This is how you register for a Zoom session and how you create registration. Anything that I could to help people shift into the virtual space quickly and easily, that's what I put out. And I guess that was my third big pivot. And it was a pivot out of necessity rather than choice. It wasn't planned, but I think that that actually made me get stuff done faster. There was no time for procrastination. There was no time for perfect. It was have an idea, find something useful, get it out to people as quickly as possible. And there the clients started to come. And I was extremely fortunate and privileged to work with some really amazing clients in those first few weeks that were as keen to be on the learning journey as I was and really test out new ideas. And every time we met, I'd say, hey, I know we've got your event this week, but how about trying this? 
And they were always, always up to it, up for it. They had the confidence, they had the passion, they had the drive to make their business succeed, which made my job even easier. And there we have it. There's me um, now late 2020 with the, heart, with the highest um, income that I've, I've ever had in the business space. Clients continuing to work with me that have worked with me from day one and new clients coming in. We're working with clients in the US, Canada, Europe and the UK. We now are a team of six. And that all came from a pivot of necessity, a pivot of urgency, a pivot that I didn't see coming. Um, and actually, all the decisions that I've made definitely in the last three years, but all the way through really, have gotten me to this point. And I really want to relate that back to you, that if you are sat in a job that you utterly hate, do something about it. Develop that side hustle. If you've got a side hustle that could be stronger, now's the time to knuckle down and think about how you can really make it profitable and thrive. If you are thinking that my business is just about ticking over, how can you accelerate it? How can you lift it to the next level so you're not constantly worrying where your next client is coming from? And that's really what I want to bring to you in this podcast series. Ideas, thoughts, inspiration, a place where you can reach out and say, I've been doing this for ages and it's not working. What can I do next? Um, a place where you can find experts to speak and give you inspiration and ideas, but really practical tips as well that you can take away and implement tomorrow. So that's me in a nutshell. Um, bags of experience, leadership skills I didn't know I had until I needed them. And recognizing that my whole being up to now is a course of pivots and yours is too. You don't, haven't set out on the same path that you set out on when you were two and continued in a straight line you're constantly reassessing what do I want how do I how am I going to achieve that and adjusting your course that's all a pivot is it can be a micro adjustment or it can be a complete 360 and that's where I want to leave you today knowing a little bit more about me your host for this roller coaster ride that we're about to go on together if this resonates with you if this resonates with anybody you know please do share it um, I know lots of people are in the same boat and I want to say it's okay on the other side. Getting out of a career is a good thing. If you don't love it, if you hate it, do something different. I'm here to support you, as is our crazy My My Events um, community on Facebook. Please do drop me a line in the comments. And let me know how you found this episode. If you want to get fired up and ready for the next episodes that are coming, do subscribe to the channel to make sure that they land in your mailbox and in your podcast file first. I look forward to seeing you at the next session and yeah, let me know your thoughts. Take care and have an awesome week. my events podcast we empower business owners to elevate scale and 10x their businesses through face-to-face -face, virtual events and beyond we talk tips hacks and stories from other entrepreneurs so that you can thrive